with the uh, Lexington uh, Postal Program. We're also glad to have you back and looking forward to your remarks. First, thank you uh, for having me, Mac, and to the Lexington Institute for organizing this forum. Uh, NARF has about 200,000 dues-paying members across the country. We are dedicated to protecting and enhancing the interests of federal and postal employees and retirees and their survivors. Postal retirees make up a substantial portion of NARF's membership, about 25%. From my experience with NARF, I can tell you postal retirees care deeply about maintaining a strong and vibrant public postal service that meets the needs of American citizens. They believe that dependable mail delivery is an inherently governmental service. But also, as employees of the United States Postal Service, they earn valuable pension and retiree health benefits in addition to their pay in exchange for years of hard work. They justifiably expect the U.S. government to live up to its end of the bargain. Ensuring it does so will always be NARF's top priority when it comes to postal reform. And let's be clear, these obligations of the US, these are obligations of the U.S. government, not just the Postal Service. The Postal Service is, and I'm quoting the U.S. Code here, an independent establishment of the executive branch of the government of the United States. So as much as we talk about it as a business, it is a government agency. It may have a different governance structure and funding model than other agencies, but it's still part of the U.S. government. That means its obligations and debts, including those detailed in the U.S. Code, like payments owed to postal retirees as retirement annuities or contributions towards retiree health insurance premiums, are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States. So barring the U.S. government defaulting on its debts, the only real threat to postal retiree pensions and health benefits is a political one, a threat of Congress changing those pension or health benefit obligations. Of course, as the Postal Service faces financial challenges, and it is closer to the prospect of not being able to pay its bills, there will be increasing political pressure to enact reforms to put it on sound financial footing to avoid or at least limit the taxpayer financing of the Postal Service. But any decision to change postal retiree benefits will remain a political one. Whether to choose that route rather than alternatives, such as modifying postal rates, expanding services by allowing the Postal Service to provide limited financial services or ship alcohol, funding on funded mandates, or any other host of other options. For postal retirees, it's difficult to see any scenario where cutting their retirement annuities or retiree health benefits that they earned over years of hard work becomes part of a politically viable solution. That's perhaps a long-winded way of providing some context for NARS views on congressional attempts at Medicare integration and, repeal, and to repeal the mandate to pre-fund postal retiree health benefits. Every leading postal reform bill over the last several Congresses has included provisions requiring postal retirees to pay additional premiums for mostly duplicative health insurance through Medicare Part B or lose their earned retiree health benefits. These provisions would have reversed the decision these retirees made to decline Medicare coverage and replace it with a paternalistic government mandate at significant additional cost, more than $1,700 per year per person or $3,500 for a married couple. For NARF and postal retirees, that crossed a red line. Changing health benefits, adding costs for postal retirees after they have retired and are living on a fixed income. That would set a dangerous precedent from our perspective for other federal employees and retirees and for basic trust that our government, directed by Congress, will keep its promises to middle class retirees. So we've been strongly opposed to imposing that requirement on current retirees, but we've never been opposed to better integration between Medicare and federal and postal retiree health benefits and we're optimistic that future postal reform bills could encourage and increase Medicare enrollment for postal retirees while pre preserving their choice as to whether to do so. That includes providing current retirees an opportunity to opt in without late enrollment penalties and automatic enrollment for retirees becoming el eligible for Medicare with an option to opt out of coverage. For postal retirees, there are some benefits to having both Part B and federal retiree health insurance, less out-of-pocket costs and co-pays and deductibles, um, and we acknowledge that many federal and postal retirees make the choice to pay those additional premiums for reduced out-of-pocket costs. But it's the retiree's choice, and we would like it to remain so. It's their choice to accept that trade-off. Better Medicare integration also includes allowing postal retiree health benefit plans to integrate with Medicare Part D for prescription drugs, 
through something called an employer group waiver plan, referred to as an EQIP plan. This would allow plans to reduce the cost of providing prescription drug coverage to Medicare eligible retirees. Use of EGWIPs is a common practice by private sector employers offering retiree health benefits. It's an easy, common sense step to take to reduce the cost of providing health benefits to pollster retirees. Part D integration doesn't actually even require any new legislation. The Office of Personnel Management could allow federal employee health benefits plans to do so as early as the next plan year. The draw of Medicare integration, whether for Part A, B, D, or all of them, is of course cost savings. When a pollster retiree is covered by both Medicare and their federal retiree health benefit plan, Medicare provides primary coverage, reducing the cost of, of providing retiree health care. Because the Postal Service is on the hook for most of the premium costs in one way or another, that's money the Postal Service would not need to find elsewhere through reduction in services. But it needs to be done the right way by preserving choice for postal retirees. Medicare integration proposals have been driven, at least in part, by the unprecedented mandate that the Postal Service fully prefund its future retiree health benefits. Not only would Medicare inter integration reduce costs for the Postal Service, but in doing so, it would almost entirely eliminate the remaining prefunding liability on its books. As you may know, the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act of 2006 mandated specific annual prefunding payments into the Retiree Health Benefits Fund over a 10 year period from 2007 to 2016, followed by continuous payments since 2017 to fully cover the remaining liability. No other federal agency or private sector company has such a requirement to fully, fully prefund its benefits. The mandate has imposed an extraordinary burden on the Postal Service. Even if the mandate made sense when enacted, when Postal Service's finances were strong and it needed to balance the CBO score, I'm not saying it did, but if it did, the prefunding mandate is clearly counterproductive today. And even though the Postal Service has not made all the required payments, the liability remains current on its books and the steering cost-cutting strategies prohibiting investments and driving and limiting options for legislative reforms. In NARS view, it was driving the problematic policy to mandate Medicare Part B coverage. It also is important to note that elim eliminating this requirement in no way, shape, or form changes the Postal Service's obligation or the U.S. government's obligation to pay postal retiree health benefits in the future. Rather, after using funds currently in the retiree health benefits fund, the Postal Service would return to pay-as-you-go funding, similar to other federal agencies and private sector businesses. Last month, the House passed the USPS Fairness Act, which would repeal the prefunding mandate. The bill would not solve all of the Postal Service's financial problems, but it does provide a common sense first step. It would rescind an unnecessary and unreasonable mandate and provide breathing room for future reforms. We hope the Senate will pass it as well. Another smart option for reform is to invest the health benefits fund in something other than the low return special issue treasury securities that it's in now. As a recent Postal Inspector General report found, over the long term, investing in a portfolio similar to the Thrift Savings Plan's life cycle funds uh, would provide higher returns, reducing the total cost providing health benefits. And while market investments entail the risk of loss, that risk should be balanced against the risk associated with the high probability that continued investment in Treasury securities imposes higher retiree health care costs on the Postal Service in the short term and over the long term. I'll note that we're more wary of proposals to invest retirement funds in the stock market. According to CRS, there's no point in the next 80 years at which the assets of the Civil Service Retirement and Disability Fund are projected to run out. More of a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it for that one. I'd like to share one additional thought on legislative process. It's been 14 years now since the last major postal reform bill was passed, and the world of communication and delivery has changed, has been changing rapidly. There's some good, simple ideas for improving Postal Service finances, like ending the pre-funding mandate, or investing in retiree health benefit funds in the stock market, or allowing FEHB plans to integrate Part D through EGWIP, not to mention the various innovations on the operations side. It's certainly easier said than done, and you may need a comprehensive bill to get started, but I think a legislative approach ought to shift to more frequent involvement, less comprehensive efforts, and more incrementalism. Big problems can become much smaller by chipping away at them bit by bit consistently over time. Whether through comprehensive reform or incremental, 
I'll just reiterate that as a representative of postal retirees, our primary interest in postal reform is simple. Keep promises to retirees, uphold the bargain that was struck. There's a wide range of options to allow the Postal Service to do so and improve its finances. On topics outside of the niche issue of postal retiree health benefits, uh, and many speakers will touch on those other issues today. NARF certainly doesn't have the answers to all those other issues in the larger world of postal reform, but we will continue to beat the drum on a simple message. Please don't balance the books of the Postal Service on the backs of postal retirees. Thank you for listening, and thank you again to the Lexington Institute for holding this forum.